my name is Robert McDougall, and the major love of my life is my wife Diane and my family. But other than that, my passion in life, my love, has been American history. I've taught it in 49, for 49 years, and I've, uh, I've written four books on the subject. I'll be saying a few things about those as we go along. I, um, I gather that all of you are interested in American history too. That's why you're here. And um, so together we'll take a little journey through some aspects of American history that are significant and important. And um, we'll be, uh, focus particularly on uh, the issue of the um, emancipation of the slaves in the United States. And for that we'll draw a lot from uh, my book, the one that just came out, the Agitator and the Politician, William Lloyd Garrison, Abraham Lincoln, and the Emancipation of the Slaves. My uh, talk today will be divided into four segments. Segment one will go into uh, some of the things that have been controversial lately, uh, statues and monuments, and we'll talk a little bit about those. That'll be a very short segment. Uh, segment two, I'd like to do an overview of slavery, the history of slavery in the United States from about 1830 to 1865 when slavery was officially ended. Now segment three will be um, <laughs> my attempt to be a playwright. I'm going to uh, write a little mini drama about Abraham Lincoln and William Lloyd Garrison about how as young men they were so far apart in their beliefs and their personal philosophies, but how they met in the White House in 1864, right in the middle of the Civil War, and realized that they had finally come together. <clears throat> and that's what my book, The Agitator and the Politician, is about, how that uh, coming together uh, occurred. You can tell me after we've done that whether I'm, I have a future as a playwright, or I should keep my date up. And then we'll get to uh, questions and discussion. Um, as we go along, if you have some questions, things you uh, are confused about, or something you'd like to ask, or some comment you'd like to make, uh, please take note of it, mental note, physical note, and we'll get to that in segment four. Uh, I'd like to save that for one segment at a time, okay? All right, let's get launched. <clears throat> Statues and monuments. I call this a problematic history because, well, it is. A lot of statues have some stories about them that maybe aren't so good, huh? There's a statue in the public garden dedicated to Charles Sumner. It says at the bottom, Sumner. Uh, he'll come up in my talk on a couple of occasions. He was a um, abolitionist senator he was from Massachusetts, and he um, was pretty much uh, opposed to slavery most of his life, and he had some pretty great accomplishments. When I started teaching, I used to think that Charles Sumner, the senator, was also the Sumner that the tunnel was named after, the Sumner Tunnel, right? Mm -hmm. And for years, I would say that to my students, you know, with the Sumner Tunnel, it was named for ten. Well, one day, Diane and I were waiting in a traffic jam to get into the Sumner Tunnel, so I had time to look at the plaque that's above the entrance to the Sumner Tunnel. And it said, Sumner Tunnel, named for William Sumner, Secretary of Transportation. <laughs> and I said, oh no, I've been telling my students faulty information. I'll have to contact all of them and set them straight. I told them lies. <clears throat> well, I'm just OCD enough that Diane believed me for a minute that I would actually do that. Then, of course, there's the most famous monument, I think, in the country, Mount Rushmore. When Diane and I were first married, we went out west on a little trip, and we visited Mount Rushmore, and it is pretty impressive. And we stood there, Diane said, wow, that's amazing, how did they do that? Well, I was kind of a wise guy, and I said, it wasn't a big deal, they just hung from ropes up on the mountain, and they took a hammer and chisel, and they just knocked off everything that didn't look like a present. Okay, 
Well, in recent years, uh, Mount Rushmore has become a subject of controversy. Some people think that the first two faces, left to right, Washington and Jefferson, don't belong there because these men, whatever they may have accomplished, they own slaves. So blast them off the mountain. Put dynamite on them and blast them away. Well, what about the next one, Theodore Roosevelt? We have plenty of evidence that he was a racist, that he did some race prejudice things and said some race prejudice things. So blast him off the mountain too. And that leaves just Abraham Lincoln. He belongs there, right? Some people have even said that he doesn't belong there. Because during the Civil War, for the first two and a half years of the Civil War, he said that if he could win the war without freeing any slaves, he would do it. And when he did free the slaves, he thought that the entire black race should be sent to some colony somewhere where they'd be happier. And so would all the white people. So put a piece of dynamite under Lincoln's whiskers and blow him off the mountain too. Well, I think that there has to be some nuance here, some of these monuments. You know, we have to realize that everybody's a failed human being. Everybody has issues. Everybody makes mistakes. So what I think is the answer to the statues and monuments problem is uh, something I brought up in my book, uh, Rants, Raves, and Reflections of an American Historian. I have a, a, a little essay in here. This is 60 different essays in American history. There's one in here called My Answer to the Statues Problem. I think uh, the viewing place, place uh, station for Mount Rushmore or as a plaque on almost any statue, there should be a full explanation of what this person was about, what he did, what he did that was bad, things that were bad about him, things that were good about him. But for the most part, I think most statues should continue. They were placed there uh, originally for a reason. Maybe it wasn't a good reason, I don't know. But if we have a, a full disclosure plaque on each one, I think it uh, takes care of the problem. Now, when we were there, we uh, fitted ourselves for Mount Rushmore. I intended to be president someday, that was me. And uh, I thought I'd look pretty good up there. And uh, Diane was gonna be the first woman president of the United States. And that would put her on Mount Rushmore. And, and don't laugh, that's not over yet. There hasn't been a woman president yet, she could still do it. Remember what Yogi said, uh, <clears throat> it ain't over until it's over. And she could still get there. But we thought we were pretty clever uh, putting our faces on Mount Rushmore with our pictures. But it turns out that everybody who goes to Mount Rushmore does the same thing. So it wasn't a big deal. Now some people say, well, if we're going to put these plaques that you talk about on each uh, monument and tell, you know, like, Washington owned slaves. Well, you should put it in a museum, they say. Well, how are you going to put the Washington Monument in a museum? There is one statue I know about that I really think should never have been put there in the first place. And that is the statue to General Hooker. It's right in front of the Massachusetts State House. It's huge. Hooker was the general who lost the Battle of Chancellorsville in the Civil War. He was a terrible general. He was known for partying at his headquarters. He was also known for the prostitutes that followed his army all over the place, and that's how they got the name Hookers. So for that, we make a statue of him at the Massachusetts State House. He was born in Massachusetts, but other than that. On Commonwealth Avenue, the mall in the middle of Commonwealth Avenue in downtown Boston is a statue to my man, my hero, William Lloyd Garrison. He was the person who first really interested me in American history because I thought, this man is unbelievable. He dedicated his entire life to an unfortunate race, to set them free. And he ultimately achieved his goal. And he was not a money maker, he was poor his entire life, but he dedicated himself to the slaves and to their freedom. And I thought that was an awesome thing to do with your life. So I got really interested in him, and that 
kind of led me into an interest in American history in general. He put out his newspaper, The Liberator, for 35 years, calling for the liberation of the slaves and equality for the black race, way ahead of his time, until 1865, when it all caught up with him. So fortunately, uh, nobody had seen fit to deface William Lloyd Garrison's statue on Commonwealth Avenue, except for some pigeons and seagulls who pooped on it. Uh, but for the most part, it does not, uh, nobody's made an attempt to pull it down. But then there's the statue of Abraham Lincoln, who actually did set the slaves free with his policies. And uh, this one is coming for some controversy because it shows Lincoln bestowing emancipation on a um, half-naked slave who's kneeling at his feet. And so it's come on for a lot of criticism. In fact, <clears throat> this, there's two versions of the statue, and the one that's at Park Square in Boston is coming down. I think they may have already taken it down because of the controversy and the protests against it. But the fact is that um, Frederick Douglass, the former slave who became an abolitionist, spoke at the dedication of the Washington version of the statue, and he said, um, well, he actually did what I advocate for the plaques on the statues. He said, yes, Lincoln didn't free the slaves willingly. He waited for a long time. He thought that the black race should be sent to colonies uh, elsewhere. Uh, so he is a problematic emancipator, but ultimately he grew into the role, and by 1865 he advocated the 13th Amendment, which freed the slaves, and he deserves this monument, according to Frederick Douglass. And so I would take Douglass's word for it, and I think this statue ought to continue to be there, and I certainly think that the monument, probably the second most impressive monument, if not the first, in the country to a former president, the Lincoln Memorial, uh, is a fitting tribute to Abraham Lincoln and what he did. And uh, I don't think anybody's thrown any paint on this one either. I would really hope not. Okay, that's my uh, view of statues and monuments. I didn't want to spend too long. We could go through hundreds of them. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, I think statues could actually be a subject of a course. You know, you could spend a lot of time, uh, take three or four of them every week and uh, talk about them. The history of slavery from 1830 to 1865, a little overview. When I started writing The Agitator and the Politician, as I mentioned, I thought that uh, I'd do the whole thing just on William Lloyd Garrison. But then I realized that uh, he was nothing without Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln may never have achieved the great thing he did, which was to emancipate the slaves, unless Garrison had stirred up the country um, to get to the point where they advocated it. And so I thought it would be interesting to do a book on both of them and show how the agitator and the politician Lincoln was a very conservative politician. Garrison was the most radical of all the uh, agitators, how they ultimately came together. And I usually always demonstrate this with uh, Lincoln moving the most towards Garrison, uh, because it was mostly Lincoln who changed. All right, well, our subject for this is slavery. And um, slavery existed in this country for well over 200 years. and. Um, Southerners had an ideal view of it. It was happy slaves working in the fields, picking cotton, singing songs. There was a book that was published of slave songs, and you ought to read the words that they were singing. They, were, they weren't happy. They were all singing about how a master was going to die someday, and uh, how they hoped he fell off his horse, and things like that. Uh, but Southerners developed a real positive view of slavery. They thought that uh, it was a positive good for both races. It organized race relations. The African people were taken care of, which they couldn't do on their own, they believed. And uh, it was just the way that society ought to be set up. John C. Calhoun, a Southern senator from South Carolina, said that all the great cultures of the past, the Romans, the Greeks, they all had slaves. That frees up the intelligent people to do intelligent things. Well, of course, the reality of slavery was very grim. It was nothing like the Southerners portrayed. It was hard work, daybreak to dusk. There was no freedom. Uh, this family of slaves 
doesn't look, doesn't look he's a bit happy to do that. And uh, that's the reality. Not to mention the fact that uh, the slave trade often involved slave traders taking children away from their uh, parents and selling them on the slave market. So this could hardly be called a positive good. In 1831, a slave named Nat Turner met in the woods with other slaves for about three months, and then in October 1831, he launched a slave rebellion. And they went from plantation to plantation, killing white plantation owners and their families. They killed ultimately 57 people. When the rebellion was finally put down, and Turner was ultimately captured and, and executed, um, you would think that maybe Southerners would have a second thought about slavery, but what their reaction was, they doubled down on it. The, now, the Turner Rebellion caused Southerners to emphasize even more that slavery was a positive good. So by the 1840s, the country was divided between slave states, those that allowed slavery and had laws to protect it, and free states. Here they are in blue. Uh, they were about equal in number, which was important because that gave them each the same number of senators in the U.S. Senate. Abraham Lincoln grew up in, well, he was born in Kentucky, grew up in Indiana, and then moved to Illinois. Uh, the first time he ever saw slavery in any numbers was on a flatboat down in New Orleans where he had taken some farm produce. Um, down to market in New Orleans, and he saw a slave market, and he saw slaves being bought and sold, and it disgusted him. Uh, but he didn't really do anything at that point. He was interested in uh, making his mark, maybe becoming a politician or a lawyer. Um, slavery, he thought, was awful, but it didn't interest him that much. But at the same time, 1831, up in Boston, William Lloyd Garrison was organizing a, an anti-slavery movement and publishing every week his newspaper, The Liberator. And The Liberator was different from almost any other uh, anti-slavery publication because it advocated the immediate emancipation of the slaves, not you know some gradual program, and no compensation to the slave owners for their loss of property. Garrison said they've stolen this, their lives. They don't. That's like giving a thief compensation when he gives up things that he's stolen and no attempt to uh, send the slaves somewhere else, like Africa or Haiti or some other place. Garrison was for the immediate, uncompensated emancipation of the slaves and equality of the races. This put him way on the extreme fringes of American society. So much so that even in Boston, he was hated and reviled. The bankers, the uh, merchants, the people who did business with the South, they thought he was going to disrupt relations with the South. He was a fanatic. And in October 1835, they had a mob together and tried to lynch him. Tried to drag him to Boston Common and hang him. The mayor saved his life, brought him, put him in jail overnight for his safety. But that's how the North was involved in slavery too. Garrison was not popular in Boston. He wasn't popular anywhere in the North. And he was so hated in the South well, one example, the state of Georgia offered a $50,000 reward for anybody who could bring them William Lloyd Garrison's ear. Lincoln, at the time Garrison was going through all that, was becoming a lawyer. And uh, in this picture, he kind of joked with the photographer, and he said, I'll mess up my hair, and you take my picture, uh, <laughs> which was very uncommon at the time. But mostly, Abraham Lincoln was a very methodical, well-organized, careful lawyer. In court, he argued strenuously for strict obedience to the law, even laws that required return of runaway slaves. Although he hated slavery, that was the law. So in the 1830s, we have Garrison going on a radical rant against slavery, Abraham Lincoln going into a career in law where he supported obeying the law, even if it was something that supported slavery. Okay, while all this was going on, big things are happening in the country. Down in Texas, the uh, 
Americans who lived in northern Texas, in a province of Texas called of, of Mexico called Texas, they uh, decided to revolt against the Mexican government. You know why? Because the Mexican government wanted to take away their slaves. The slave, uh, I mean, the Texans were slave owners mostly. Uh, Jim Bowie, very famous Texan at, who died at the Alamo, uh, was a slave trader. Um, well, the Texans won their independence. Texas became an independent republic, the Lone Star Republic. That's why their state flag has one star on it. And for nine years, it was like a separate country, a country that supported slavery. Well, then in 1846, we ended up uh, in a war with Mexico. And we won that war, and that brought California into the Union, as well as all of the land uh, to the that goes between California and Texas. And now the question was going to be, will those territories be available for slavery? Will people be able to move into those territories and keep their slaves? Will slavery be allowed? The Southerners said, it better be allowed. If it's not allowed, we're going to leave the Union. And a lot of Northerners are beginning to think, well, we don't want, well, one thing they said, we don't want black people in those territories. And so the argument got pretty heated. In those days, when an argument got heated between the North and the South, they turned to the senator from Kentucky, Henry Clay, who had a reputation as the great compromiser. And without going into the details, he came up with a proposal that finally calmed everybody down, kept the South from seceding from the Union, and uh, held the Union together. We call it the Compromise of 1850. And in this compromise, California came into the Union as a free state, a state that did not allow slavery, not because the Californians loved black people or were not racist, quite the contrary. They were very racist. They didn't want any black people in California. The best way to keep them out was to be a free state. Uh, so let's not give any kudos to the Californians here. The rest of the territory between California and Texas Utah and New Mexico were created, and they would decide whether slavery would be allowed there by the people voting who moved into the territory. They could vote it up or they could vote it down. A concept called popular sovereignty. Now, to sweeten the deal for Southerners, because they are, after all, they weren't going to get California, Henry Clay included in the Compromise of 1850 the Fugitive Slave Act. This required all Americans federal law, to return runaway slaves. If you uh, saw a runaway slave or came into contact with one, you were supposed to report them to the authorities. Well, up here in New England, in Boston in particular, we became a sanctuary, Boston became a sanctuary city. Runaway slaves could go there and the people of Boston would protect them. They disobeyed the federal law. This sign was posted all over Boston, slave hunters among us, be on your guard, and the rest is planned for tonight. The slave hunters uh, had a tough time in Boston, and the South was enraged that the one thing they got out of the Compromise of 1850 was not working because the Northerners were not obeying it. They weren't obeying the Fugitive Slave Law. Then in 1852, a book came out called Uncle Tom's Cabin. The story of a saintly slave named Uncle Tom, a really Christian, good man, and uh, at the end of the book, the slave owner, Simon Legree, whips Uncle Tom to death. When this uh, book was put on stage, the audiences would leave the theater weeping over the poor fate, uh, the, the fate of poor Uncle Tom. And while he was being whipped to death, Tom would say, Master, I forgive you, I forgive you. Good Lord, please help Master. He doesn't know what he's doing. This book just wrenched people. It was a big seller. It was the second best seller in the country uh, in the North, second only to the Bible. In the South, you took your life in your hands if you even showed up with a copy of it. You didn't dare, because it was banned in the South. Then up comes Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Uh, in my book, I recount how Douglas and Lincoln both were vying for the hand of Mary Todd. They were. Uh, rivals for many, many years. It didn't just come up when uh, 
they had the debates. Well, in 1854, Stephen Douglas proposed a new law called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He wanted to organize Kansas and Nebraska territories and allow the people who moved into those territories to vote whether they would have slavery or not. Well, okay, isn't that democratic? Isn't that what they did in Utah and New Mexico or what they were going to do under the Compromise of 1850? Well, that's what Douglas said. It was a very reasonable thing. It's democratic. But slavery had been prohibited from all of the territories north of the southern border of Missouri ever since 1820. This was new territory that could be open to slavery. A lot of northerners were very, very unhappy about that. And... Um, they began organizing a new political party to oppose slavery in the territories. And the party was going to be called the Republican Party. One of the uh, members of the new Republican Party was our friend Charles Sumner. And he gave a dramatic speech in the Senate one day called The Crime Against Kansas, in which he was enraged that Kansas could become a slave state. Two days later, after he gave that speech, a southerner named Preston Brooks, who was a member of the House of Representatives, came into the Senate chamber, went up to Sumner at his desk, and started whacking him over the head with a uh, walking cane. Whack, 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 whack. And some of the senators were getting a big kick out of that because some of them didn't like Sumner, and they were glad to see him getting beat up. Well, remember I said he needed an ice pack? When, the, uh, when he had snow on his head on the, on the statue. Did I say that? I meant to. Well, he needed a nice back now because he got really beat up. And it was three years before he returned to the Senate. Uh, his empty chair actually was a testimonial to how uh, bad the Southerners could handle things. Uh, then came the Dred Scott decision. You know, the Supreme Court is very important, as we're going to find out in the next few weeks. And it was never more important than it was when it made the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a slave who uh, spent some time in free territories north of the 3630 line uh, with his master. His master brought him there to you know, be his manservant. Well, slave uh, uh, Dred Scott the slave was smart enough to know that while he was in free territory, he could be a free man. And so his lawyers took the case to court. Dred Scott versus Sanford. Sanford was his owner. And uh, when it reached the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, a Virginia slave owner, handed down the decision of the court, seven to two. And he said three things in the Dred Scott decision. Number one, Dred Scott is a slave, and he has no standing in court. He has no right. He's not a citizen. He doesn't have any right to sue. Only citizens can sue in court. He's not a citizen. Now, if Tony had ended right there, it wouldn't have been that big a deal. It would have been annoying and unfair, but it wouldn't have been that big a deal. But then he went on to say, no black man has any rights that any white man is bound to respect. Well, even that wouldn't have uh, caused this to be a, a case that we all know about in American history. It was the third thing that Tawney said that was the big deal. He said, it is unconstitutional for Congress or a territorial government to outlaw slavery in a territory. It's unconstitutional for there be any law to say that the people can't bring their slaves into Kansas or Nebraska or New Mexico or Utah Forget about popular sovereignty. They can't vote it in. It's got to be allowed. Because the Fifth Amendment says that no person may be denied his property, his property, without due process of law. And that's what would be happening, Tony said. If you know, if you look at the law exactly and you know interpret it in a very strict way, he kind of had a point, but of course he wanted this point. Uh, so the Dred Scott decision landed on the country like a bombshell. Because now, the Republican Party that was getting started with the platform of banning slavery from the territories was banning something that the Supreme Court had just said was unconstitutional. Right? 
court had just said, you can't ban slavery from the territory. Well, that didn't stop him, though. And Abraham Lincoln, uh, in 1858, became a member of the Republican Party. And he ran against Stephen Douglas, as, we, as you probably know, for the Senate seat that Douglas held. And the debates were quite something. I've read all of them. They had seven debates all over Illinois. And um, in these debates, Stephen Douglas would say, popular sovereignty is the way it should be decided. The people who move into a territory should decide. And Lincoln would say, so it's okay with you if they vote to have slavery. Slavery is an immoral institution. See, Lincoln was getting, so we would really uh, be willing to say that. But if you read the debates carefully and watch what he did in southern Illinois, where more southerners lived than in northern Illinois, Lincoln always tailored his remarks a little differently. He'd say, we want the, the Republican Party wants the territories available for homesteads for free white men. So if you want to be able to move out west and set up a farm, you should vote Republican. You should vote for me. It was a very racist tinge to what Lincoln was saying in southern Illinois in order to try to win votes, right? Uh, but his basic stand was slavery should be banned from the territories. Most people agree that Lincoln won the debate, the debates on, on debate, debate points, but Douglas won the election by a tiny margin. And so Douglas went back to the Senate. Lincoln kind of went into oblivion. He thought he was done. He, could, he couldn't win the Senate race, so where was he going to go? Then, as so often happens in American history, a man comes along who does something really outrageous that kind of changes everything. John Brown. In 1859, John Brown got a little army together of 20 men. Three of them were his sons. And he invaded Virginia, attacked the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, in order to seize the guns in the arsenal, and then go into Virginia and distribute them among the slaves, and perhaps ignite a slave rebellion. I think he pictured it as, you know how you start a fire, you start a little fire here, and, and then it turns into a big conflagration. Um, he saw it that way, or he was at least going to try to get a huge runaway uh, slave thing going on where hundreds of them would escape. Well, whatever his plan was, he was a little vague, um, it, it failed. A contingent of U.S. Army soldiers under Robert E. Lee uh, came out to Harpers Ferry, killed most of the uh, raiders, captured John Brown. He was put on trial for treason, and he was executed. But now the country has two icons. You know how an icon is a symbol of something? For the Southerners, John Brown was the icon of anybody in the North who was against slavery, in any, in any fashion. They could have used William Lloyd Garrison as that icon, but now John Brown, who actually was going to give guns to the slaves, he was the icon. All the others who oppose slavery or who even say anything against it are like John Brown. And Northerners had their icon for who the Southerners were. And who was that? Simon Legree, remember the slave owner and the fictitious slave owner? who whipped his slave to death in Uncle Tom's cabin. Well, all Northerners thought of Southerners as Simon Legree. Southerners thought of Northerners as John Brown. When you've got a situation like that where both sides have vilified the other side so much, you've got a tough election coming up. In 1860, it's a long story, but Lincoln won the election as the Republican candidate for president. How he went from being defeated in the Senate race against Douglas to being a Republican candidate is an interesting story, which is in my book. As soon as Lincoln was elected, the southern states began to secede. At first, it was just the dark blue states, the deep south, the Gulf states, the ones that get all the hurricanes. Uh, south Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina was first. Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. They all left the Union right away when Lincoln was elected, even before he took office. They weren't even going to wait to see what he did. And they started their own government, the Confederate States of America, and they invited all of the other slave states to join them. Uh, but the others waited. They wanted to see a little bit about what Lincoln would do. 
Well, when Lincoln took office, he said in his first inaugural, I'm going to enforce the law and I'm going to uphold the remaining federal forts that are still occupied by Union troops. When he tried to provision the fort at Fort Sumter in South Carolina, the Confederate guns fired on the fort and now there's a rebellion. Lincoln calls for volunteers to put down the Southern Rebellion. All of the slave states have to make their choice now. Are they going to stay loyal to the Union or are they going to go with the South? The states in gray, most notably Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, they all secede. And now we've got a full-scale civil war, <clears throat> the biggest civil war in history, really. Uh, the North versus the South, the War of the Southern Rebellion, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and here's how the sides set up. We have <clears throat> uh, slave states numbering 11, and then the free states in the North, but most interestingly, there are four slave states who do not secede. They stay loyal to the Union, and this is critical. Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and the western portions of Virginia, which halfway through the war becomes the state of West Virginia, that whole border region stays loyal to the Union. And Lincoln knew that that was the key to this whole war. If we could keep those states loyal to the Union, that would determine everything. He, he was convinced that would be the, uh, how the end result would come about. So, during the war, try to make this as succinct as possible. Lincoln's slavery policies. In 1861, the first year of the war, Lincoln said, this war is only to defeat Southern secession, not to free the slaves. No, sir, not going to free the slaves. This is just to save the Union. He even had the soldiers in his army return runaway slaves because Lincoln's position was the law should always be obeyed while it's the law. We have the fugitive slave law in effect, so if some slaves show up in our ranks, send them back, because that's what the law says. Lincoln wanted to prove to Southerners that, hey, you know, I'm a reasonable person, I obey the law. 1862, the war's been going on for over a year. Now, in the summer of that year, Lincoln signs a bill that says that the slaves that are confiscated from rebels, people who are actually in the Southern Army, who may have brought their manservant with them or brought some of their slaves to dig trenches or whatever, if those slaves are captured, they will be set free. Slaves of actual rebels will be free. But then, a few months later, Lincoln issues what's called the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. The slaves will be freed in all areas still in rebellion against the Union on January 1st, 1863. In other words, if a state is still out of the Union, come New Year's Day, 1863, their slaves will be free. Notice how much he's still going cautious here. He's saying, I'm going to do this in 100 days. September 22nd was yesterday, right? That was the anniversary of the Emancipation the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Think of how much time there is between now and New Year's Day. That's what time they had to get back in the Union and keep their slaves. He just wanted to give them every possible chance to keep their slaves. None of them came back. And so on January 1st, 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed all slaves in areas that were in rebellion against the Union. In other words, all of the states of the Confederacy but not in Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Those states were loyal. They did to keep their slaves, for now. One of the bonuses of the Emancipation Proclamation is that now Lincoln uh, is free to form black regiments to fight in the Union Army. And in the end, uh, over 200,000 black soldiers signed up for the Union Army. If you've seen the movie, uh, um, that was a Glory. Glory. The Massachusetts 54th, um, thank you, man. That's why I love him. He's there to help me. And uh, fought for the Union cause, and there were a lot of uh, black soldiers who did that. Then, when the war ended, Lincoln ushered through the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. 
which freed all of the slaves in the United States, even in the border states. The 13th Amendment was the official end of slavery in the United States. Uh, this is an attempt to make up a little play about a meeting that occurred between William Lloyd Garrison, the radical agitator, uh, abolitionist, and Abraham Lincoln in the White House on June 10th, 1864. Lincoln has already issued his Emancipation Proclamation, and um, the war is still going on. Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts has uh, arranged a meeting between Garrison and Lincoln. And so now we're in the ante room of the president's office. Senator Henry Wilson and Garrison wait to see the president. I'll bet when you were a boy growing up in Newburyport, you never dreamed you would one day meet the President of the United States in the White House. No, indeed. I was so poor, I surely thought I'd meet the Lord before I'd ever meet the President. What were your early years like that drove you to become an abolitionist? My mother was a devout Baptist who had a very strict moral code. As a lad, I learned that there were things in this world that were evil and it needed to be opposed by all righteous people. <laughs> I have noticed that you've never had much trouble speaking forcefully against evil. You must have inherited that ability from your mother. But why did you take up the sin of slavery? In Newburyport, I learned the uh, printing trade, and I found it was very satisfying to have my thoughts um, in type for other people to read. I especially wanted my thoughts to be read by the lordly rich people who lived up on High Street. Uh, and so at first I tried to appeal to them by partly espousing the policies of the Federalist Party. But then I found it was more satisfying and more true to myself to oppose them. Well, so what does that have to do with slavery? Uh, let me explain. A few years later I was working in a small I was working at a small newspaper in Boston and living at a boarding house. One night a man joined us for dinner. His name was Benjamin Lundy. He published a newspaper called The Genius of Universal Emancipation, and he invited us to join the anti-slavery society. Well, nobody in the room responded to him, but I thought his cause was a good one, and I signed on. I was gratified to take on a cause that was so clearly righteous and a good way to tweak the high and the mighty from Newburyport. Many of them made their fortunes in the slave trade, and I was now calling them out for their sins. Ah, I see the connection now. I remember Lundy and his paper, but I didn't realize you were associated with him. Well, our partnership didn't last long. He advocated gradual emancipation some system whereby emancipation would not happen all at once. Also, he favored colonizing the freed Negroes in Africa or in some Caribbean island. I thought both of those ideas were horrendous. So we went our separate ways. I wanted to publish a paper that would be true to my principles. And so, you started the Liberator. Yes, but it wasn't easy to get funding for my paper or even to find a press and type to print it with. Some of the early editions were printed with borrowed type. But I'm proud to say, after that first edition on New Year's Day, 1831, the paper never missed an edition and was always remained true to its first editorial. I will be as hard as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to think, speak, or write with moderation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. Audacious words for a man with no money, very few readers, and surrounded by people who hated his guts and wanted him to shut up. Yes, my printing office was just a few hundred yards from Faneuil Hall, the so-called cradle of liberty, where speeches had been made during the revolution about freedom. Now, speakers in Faneuil Hall were plummeting mobs to silence me because of my calls for freedom. Ah, the irony. Would you say that the attempt by the Boston uh, mob to hang you was a turning point in your crusade? Yes, and I even knew it at the time. A lot of the men in that mob that attacked me in October 1835 were wealthy merchants and bankers. 
They were afraid that my calls for emancipation would disrupt the profitable relationships that they had with the southern cotton growers, so they were going to drag me to the common where they would spring me up. The mayor and the police saved me, not because they liked me, but because they didn't want a murder on their hands. I was thrown in jail for my safety. Those hooligans did not intimidate me. The next week, the Liberator came out as usual, and we had 40 new subscribers. The brutal attempt to silence me aroused sympathy for me and stimulated interest in my cause. As I said to my wife, many thanks to the mob. This set a pattern for the rest of my career. The more outrageously the pro-slavery people attacked against me, the more I support I picked up. So you think extreme views are not only your actual beliefs, they were good strategy. Absolutely, it was a happy marriage of principle and practicality. Part two, the politician. <clears throat> the ante room uh, in the office of the President of the United States. President Lincoln finishes some paperwork with his secretary, John Hay, and prepares to meet his next visitor, William Lloyd Garrison. In the first years of the war, the man waiting to see me would have come in ranting and raving about how I had no pity for the slaves and was foolishly trying to win the war without eliminating slavery at central cause. Well, that's certainly true. There were times, especially at the meetings of the anti-slavery societies, where he stood up for you. He calmed down some of the hotheads, such as Wendell Phillips, by reminding them that you had to win the war or no slaves would be free. He was right. The border states would have bolted to the Confederacy if we had announced in the first months that the struggle was for emancipation. We also would have lost the conservative northerners who only wanted to save the Union and not free the slaves. I was pleased that Mr. Garrison understood that. Did you ever meet Mr. Garrison before today? Never. I heard of him 30 years ago when he was mobbed in Boston and almost lynched. I didn't agree with his demand for the immediate emancipation of the slaves with no compensation to the slave owners for their lives of property. He also vehemently opposed colonization of the black race, which I thought, and still think to this day, was the best solution to the problem. But I still believe he had a right to seek his mind and publish his paper. Did Garrison know who you were in the 1830s? <laughs> Me, an Illinois legislator who served one unremarkable term in Congress? I surely doubt that he had heard of me, at least until I debated Douglas for the Senate seat in 1858. You hated slavery your entire life. How were you different from Mr. Garrison? You're right, I hated slavery from the time I first saw a slave market in New Orleans. But when I was young, every person I encountered, even in Illinois, was racist to the core and adamantly in favor of keeping slavery. So I was not at all an abolitionist. And then there were the legal issues. Right, when I became a lawyer, I realized how the right to property was embedded in the law and in the U.S. Constitution. The Fifth Amendment to the Constitution prohibits the government from taking a citizen's property without due process of law. And I valued the law above all things. Any law that is in place needs to be obeyed as long as it is in place. So if the country had never expanded westward, do you think the fight over slavery would have ever reached the point of war between the slaveholding states and the free states. I was one of many Americans who hated slavery, but was willing to allow the southern states to have it if that's what they wanted. But when we annexed Texas and then defeated Mexico and annexed California, I began to hold the position that slavery was wrong and should not be allowed to expand beyond the 15 states that already had it. My hope was that if it were confined, it would ultimately cease to exist. So that's when the Republican Party came in. Right. And then Senator Douglas really infuriated me and many other Northerners with his Kansas-Nebraska Act. That law allowed settlers in Kansas to, have, to vote to have slavery, even though Kansas had been closed to slavery because it lay north of the 36-30 line. Douglas had no moral objections to slavery being voted into an area where it had never existed before. I am still baffled by the South's reaction to your election as president. They acted as if William Lloyd Garrison himself was going into the White House. That was crazy. I repeatedly assured Southerners that I only wanted to confine slavery to the places where it already existed, that I had no intention of abolishing it. 
In my first inaugural address, I even offered a 13th Amendment to the Constitution that would guarantee slavery in all of the states that wish to have it. Now, sir, if we do win this war, there will likely be a 13th Amendment that will abolish slavery. Won't that be ironic? <laughs> Indeed. Shall I show Mr. Garrison in now? Yes, I'm in a mood to meet the infamous incendiary. Scene three, the radical agitator meets the politician. The scene, Lincoln's office. Welcome to the White House, Mr. Garrison. It's a pleasure at long last to meet the famous, or should I say infamous, incendiary abolitionist. Mr. President, it is my honor to meet you. Take a seat, Mr. Garrison. I think we both need to savor this moment. Indeed. As a young child, as a young man, and even up until a few months ago, I never thought such an honor as this would even be possible. As a child, I was a penniless beggar and printer's apprentice in Newburyport. As a young man and in the middle age, I was a despised agitator, more likely to meet with a noose than to meet the President of the United States. Actually, through most of my life, I was as unlikely to be in this room as you were. In my youth, I was a dirt farmer, a flat boatman, a store clerk, known mostly for my wrestling prowess and my ability to tell a story. As a politician, I was defeated as often as I was elected, and after my loss to Douglas for the Senate seat, I seemed to be headed for oblivion, lost in the mists of history. From 1830 to 1860, we traveled pretty rocky paths. Two of my children died, and I know you suffered the same calamity. Yes, and the loss of poor Willie right here in the White House, when the war was in its most difficult stages, was almost more than I could bear. It has been over two years since the Willie died, and Mary still suffers grievously. Not only were you grieving, but the war was going badly, and you were also in the throes of trying to decide what to do about slavery. It must have been very difficult. It was. In my heart, I wanted to free the slaves, just as you did. But I knew that if I did that too soon, I would lose Kentucky. I wanted to have God on our side, but I had to have Kentucky. <laughs> I tried to explain your predicament to my followers, but they are a tough group to keep calm, as I'm sure you appreciate but after you stood by your Emancipation Proclamation, even though it only freed slaves in the Confederacy, I knew we were in good hands, and so did most of the members of the Anti-Slavery Society. Of course, as a lawyer, I had to be more aware than most of the people about the letter of the law, which included the right to property. That's why I had to frame the proclamation as a war measure, necessary to put down the rebellion. But what of the border states? Will you support a 13th Amendment to free all of the slaves in the United States? The Republican Party, which has just nominated you for a second term, has included a 13th Amendment in its platform. Do you approve? Absolutely. As a practical matter, it would hardly be possible for Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland to keep slaves when they would be surrounded by free states. And as a moral matter, the time has come for a new birth of freedom, as I said in my address at Gettysburg. I can't tell you, Mr. Lincoln, how much it gladdens my heart to hear that. In 1829, the judge in Baltimore, just a few miles from here, threw me in jail for libeling a slave trader. Little did I know then, as I sat in jail and wrote anti-slavery messages on the walls, that I would one day sit barely a few miles away in the White House, talking to the president, who was freeing the slaves. Yes, <clears throat> you, all of us, have come a long way. Yesterday on my way down here, I stopped in Baltimore to see if I could find that old jail, but apparently it's been torn down. <laughs> Back then, you couldn't get out of that jail. Yesterday, you couldn't get in. Mr. President, you have other appointments. Of course, never enough time to savor anything, but it has been a pleasure to talk to you, Mr. Garrison, and to celebrate the fact that at long last, we now stand on common ground. The pleasure certainly has been all mine, and miraculous to say, I believe I shall cast my first presidential vote in this year's election. At long last, there is a candidate with solid anti-slavery views. The denouement, the final part. Part four, victory and tragedy. The date, April 9th, 1865, in the office of the President of the United States. 
Last summer, I wondered if this day would ever come, especially after Grant's losses and the feeling many of us had that the war would never end. And then came the fall of Atlanta. Sherman's telegram that he had captured Atlanta changed the complexion of everything. Suddenly, victory in the war seemed not only possible, but likely. In November, we swept McClellan and the Democrats quite solidly. And then the Confederacy's defeat was just a matter of time. And so was emancipation. Oh, not so much. There was still a tough battle to be fought over that. Many of the Democrats who supported the war to save the Union were ready to repeal the Emancipation Proclamation and restore slavery, at least in some form. Remember, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery nationwide was passed in the Senate last year, but defeated in the House. We had a battle on our hands. As I said at the time, we are like whalers who have long been on a chase. We have at last got the harpoon into the monster, but we must now look how we steer, or with one flop of his tail, he will send us all into eternity. Fortunately, we were able to make a few deals and twist just enough arms to get the 13th Amendment passed. By two votes. Tad has told me what a thrill it was for you last week to walk the streets of Richmond after Grant's army had captured the city and actually see some of the African Americans that you had freed. It was not I who freed them. Thousands of young men gave their lives for that cause. I was simply God's instrument, and I tried to bless the throngs of chilling people who followed me through the streets as he would want me to. But what next for the country and the freedmen? Taking a pocket knife from his coat and slowly whittling the end of a pencil. I wish I had some simple answers. We have tax ahead of us almost greater than the war itself. What is the way forward to the freedmen? How will they be educated? How will they earn their livelihood? And how will they fit into society? All I know right now is that we must proceed, as I said in my inaugural address five weeks ago, with malice toward none, with charity for all. Final scene, December 31st, 1865 in the offices of the Liberator in Boston, Mass. William Lloyd Garrison sets the final edition of the Liberator in type, and he reminisces with his son, Wendell Phillips Garrison, about their lives. It will be strange next week, after 35 years, not to be putting out another edition of the Liberator. Yes, it will, but I am very ready to lay down my composing stick. After 35 years of struggle, I'm tired. Your mother is ill. The cause has been achieved. I'm 60 years old. It's time to retire and leave it to others to fight the remaining battles. I do wish that President Lincoln, after all he did to bring about emancipation, would also have reached age 60 and retired. Weeping slightly, yes, he was only 56 when that deranged man killed him. I'll never forget when we heard the news. We were on our way home from Charleston, where we had celebrated the raising of the flag over Fort Sumter when we heard what had happened the night before in Ford's theater. Do you think Lincoln would have handled the situation with the freedmen better than Andrew Johnson has so far? Oh, I have no doubt he would have. The black codes in the southern states are practically restoring slavery, and Lincoln never would have stood for that. Well, so for that reason, my namesake, Wendell Phillips, says you should have continued to lead the American Anti-Slavery Society and continued to publish The Liberator. What do you think about that? I will continue to speak for the colored race and I will support the radical Republicans in Congress who will work to protect their rights. But my role in this great drama is over. As I said in my final editorial that I just said in type, happy am I to be no longer at odds with the mass of my fellow countrymen on the subject of slavery. Uh, does anybody have a question that you thought of? Yes, sir. You talked about statues and monuments, but you seem to, I don't know if you shied away from this, but how do you feel about the Civil War monuments? Uh, well, which one? Were the ones like Robert E. Lee and things like that, Jackson yeah. and others, and also about the military bases named for Yes, those generals. very good question. In my book, um, American History is More Than the Crack You Learned in High School, a little take on Paul Simon's song. Um, I have a chapter called Rogues and Cautionary Tales. And one of my cautionary tales in there is Robert E. Lee. 
a man who followed what I think was the wrong principle. He had many principles, but the one about states' rights and slavery, thank you. Is that what you wanted? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, was the wrong one to follow, I believe. Um, in my opinion, he was a traitor. Um, he waged war against his country. Uh, in the book, I say, I don't think he should be uh, on the, uh, the name of that university, Washington and Lee University. I don't care if he was the president of it for five years after the war. I still don't think his name should be honored like that. Um, so, no, no I, don't, I don't like Robert E. Lee being, there's a huge statue of him, as you know, in Charlottesville. But having said that, uh, in my other book, as I mentioned earlier, Rants, Rays, and Reflections, I take a little more moderate view. And I say, well, they put up the statue, he did leave the defense of Richmond for two years, three years, and um, he was a significant figure. He was punished at the end of the war. They took his plantation and made it into Arlington National Cemetery as a grave site for the Union soldiers. So um, maybe a plaque on the statue of Lee that said what he did. In fact, they give us a recommendation and said how that plaque should read uh, and point out that he waged war against his own country and he was what, fighting a war to preserve slavery. Um, Maybe that would be the thing to do. But if I had to choose, leave it there or take it down, Robert E. Lee, I'd take it down. Uh, others, I'm not so sure. I would take that statue of Hooker down right away. Uh, I would take the statue down of uh, Stonewall Jackson, some of the other, uh, and they're carving him in the, uh, in the mountain there in Georgia. And I don't think that should happen either. So, I, you know, we're erecting the statue to somebody is quite an honor for the person. And I'm not so sure some of those people that waged war against their country deserve that honor. <clears throat> so if I have to choose, keep the statues or take them down for Confederates, I'd have to say take them down. But mostly I'd like to have us all come together and have a plaque on each one that says, lays the full story out. Even on the Washington Monument, tell the people that he owned slaves. Even in the Lincoln Memorial somewhere, tell the story of how he did this uh, emancipation. It wasn't a straight line course. People should know that. Okay, yes? I have uh, two questions about Garrison. First of all, you know, did he have any relations with other abolitionists? Did he ever meet with John Brown, Angelina, Grimke, Harriet Beecher Stowe? Well, what were the relations among those famous and sometimes not so famous? <clears throat> Excellent question. Sometimes uh, they did meet. He had the uh, organization called the American Anti-Slavery Society. But in 1840, there was a split, and he led a radical fringe that left the other group, kept the American Anti-Slavery Society name. But they were much more radical. They wanted the immediate abolition of slavery, as I said. Um, so some of those people that you mentioned, he didn't really have... Well, John Brown, for example, John Brown came to one of Garrison's meetings of the American Anti-Slavery Society, and he stomped out of the meeting. He was even more radical than Garrison. He stomped out of the meeting and said, these men are all talk. What we need is action. And so he goes off and tries to lead a rebellion and attack the Harper's Ferry uh, arsenal. So uh, yes, he had a lot of not so famous friends who were abolitionists. Uh, they had kind of a little warm feeling among themselves, you know, they were on the good cause, you know, and they would have celebrations. Every year they'd put on a big Christmas festival and sell things, everything that was not made with slave labor, to try to raise money for the cause. So we did have a lot of friends, but not really the ones that are well known. Um, and also, you mentioned that he, Garrison sort of retired after the emancipation, final emancipation. What was his reaction um, when Reconstruction was cut short? You couldn't have done that better if you were a shill for me, because that was the question I want to answer right now. Other people have asked it too. Excellent question. Um, somebody asked it to me a little more pointedly. They said, I've read your book, and at the end, you seem to be disapproving of Garrison, that he retired too soon, that he left the 
you know, he got the emancipation, but then he just let the black people in the South suffer under Reconstruction, uh, especially what happened after Reconstruction. Well, I prepared just a quick run through of what happened um, in the years right after 1865. So, thank you, sir. African American life after 1865. Um, Lincoln signed a bill creating the Freedmen's Bureau in March of 1865, which was run by the Army. It set up schools. A lot of the teachers for the schools came from the North. This woman in the picture came from the North. They came south to do good works for the freedmen, to try to help them get an education, to try to help them learn a trade, to help them with any legal problems they might run into. Um, white Southerners resented this terribly. And so the Freedmen Bureau, um, for the four years of its existence, had a lot of people who came south uh, from the north, and at that time a popular luggage was a, a carpet bag. So they were called carpet baggers, which was a derogatory term. Um, so that was, gave the freedmen some help. Congress, with the radical Republicans, um, did a lot. They passed the 14th Amendment. The 13th set the slaves free. The 14th said, all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So Alabama, don't go thinking you're going to not have them be citizens. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And then the two big ones. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In other words, a black man, or any person really, but can't be deprived of his farm or his possessions without having a trial or, you know, being committed a crime or something. Due process of law. And nor can any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Equal protection. You know the word equal never appears in the Constitution until this. It's the first time it shows up. Equal. But even at that, as we know, if you segregate people, can they still be equal? The Supreme Court said yes in the late 1800s. And then the 15th Amendment said that the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Again, the radical Republicans try to cover all the bases. Can't deny somebody the right to vote because of his race or because he used to be a slave. Okay. But um, there's always a few loopholes. It doesn't say you can't keep him from voting because he can't write. Literacy test, right? Doesn't say anything about that, so there was a loophole. But on paper, anyway, the 14th Amendment gave the freedmen citizenship and the right to vote. A lot of people disparage President Grant. Uh, they say, well, he was a pretty good general, but he was a terrible president. Well, there was corruption in Grant's administration, but one thing he did that was really good, he used the Force Acts of 1870 and 71, which he got Congress to pass, to destroy the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan had been organized to terrorize black people. Every time a black person tried to step up and assert his rights, the Klan would make uh, trouble for that guy, if not murder him. Well, Grant saw to it that the Klan was wiped out. And some people say, well, the Ku Klux Klan exists to this day. Yeah, it came back in 1915. But in 1872, Grant got rid of it. And then uh, Charles Sumner, when he wasn't busy with his tunnel, got the Civil Rights Act of 1875 passed, which said that Americans, Af African Americans have equal treatment in public transportation and accommodations. So you might think by 1875 that the African American free men are in good shape. They got citizenship, they have the right to vote, they have uh, laws against discriminating against them, so when Garrison died in 1879, I think he felt that he had done his job getting the slaves uh, free. Congress had carried on to give the slaves, uh, or the freedmen, their rights. And the things were going to be okay for the African Americans. So I don't think he uh, felt guilty about retiring uh, as he did. But there was one pill in all that jam, as the British say. There was one thing that the 
freedmen did not have. They had all those rights in the 14th and 15th Amendment. They had the Civil Rights Act. They had all kinds of things uh, going for them. But they didn't have land. They didn't have an economic basis for their lives going forward. Now you've probably heard the expression 40 acres and a mule. That was being bandied about in the late 1860s and early 1870s. Representative Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania and Senator Sumner of Tunnel Fame from Massachusetts both supported this idea that the plantations of the traitorous slave owners who had waged war against their country should be confiscated and divided up into 40 acre farms for the slaves. And that each slave should be given a mule to help him with his farm. 40 acres and a mule. You know, if they had actually done that, it might have made things different. But it would never happen. The Republicans in Congress had a tough time going so far as to taking the Southerners' property away in slaves, in freeing the slaves. That vote on the 13th Amendment, were you surprised at how close it was? It only passed by two votes. All of the Democrats were against freeing the slaves, and some Republicans were too. To take the uh, Southerners' land away from them as well was one step beyond where they were willing to go. And so the black people in the South who had just been freed never got 40 acres and a mule. Instead, many of them had to become sharecroppers where they would farm the land that would be owned by a white man. They would give him a share of the crop, hence sharecropping. And basically their lives were getting up at daybreak, working in the fields, coming back to your cabin in the evening, cabin on a dirt floor, working six days a week, just as they had been under slavery. For many black people, day-to-day -day life after emancipation wasn't all that much different than it had been under slavery. In this picture, the slave owner, I, mean, I should say the sharecropper, uh, the white man who owned the land, is there with his gun, as you notice. And um, a lot of these people owe him money. And as the law says, they can't leave the county if they owe him money. So how is that much different from slavery, right? So if they had done an economic, that was the best time for reparations that there ever was. There's talk of reparations now. They should have done it then. When they had traders, slave owners, and those who had fought against their country, land could be taken from them and given to the slaves. That's my view. OK, um, any other questions? Very good questions. Thank you so much for coming in today, Robert. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, is this going to be your only um, lecture, or are you going to be doing this ongoing? Well, <clears throat> I put a lot of time into preparing this, so I hope I get to do it again. <laughs> so my answer is, uh, I have, well, I'm going to Winchester uh, in a couple of weeks, but beyond that, I, I don't know. So I've contacted a bunch of uh, places, a lot of senior centers to ask if they'd like to uh, have me. But this COVID thing has shut everything down, so uh, you know, a lot of them aren't willing to commit yet. Kelly's been willing to take the risk. And you're welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, if you're interested in my books, we have them here. My wife, Diane, is in the back. And um, if you really think you might want to buy one, I'd prefer you bought it from me, because <laughs> I do better that way than you buy it on Amazon. Uh, but if you decide later you want one, I have a sheet back there that Diane's holding up that gives all of this information here, the, the four titles of the books and uh, my email address. So if anybody wants to buy one of my books, you can just email me, harmicdougal66 at gmail.com, and I will uh, you can give me your address, I'll mail you a book, you mail me a check, that's how it works. Okay, but right now, you can buy one before you leave, if you'd like. Anything else? It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.